Amen. All right, you may be seated. It's good to see you this morning, and uh, I got, I don't know about you, but I got really soaked coming in. A sweater seemed like a really good idea until I had to carry a bunch of stuff for the bags in, and then I had my sweater drying back there, and I probably should just be doing the t-shirt thing this morning, but uh, it was a, it's a damp morning, and so it's, it's great to see you in spite of the weather out there and uh, in spite of the busyness of uh, this time of year. Um, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get started with the message for today. Father, we, we thank you for calling us to this place. We believe that, Lord, no one is here by mistake, that we've been called by you, and uh, you're going to speak now through your word, and uh, we pray that our hearts would be attentive to what you have to say that you'd work through the preacher, and in spite of the preacher, you'd work in spite of our hearts. And, and Lord, just speak to us your word, your truth, your peace during this time. Uh, we give you the glory and uh, wait patiently um, on how you're going to move this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Well, we began last week by talking about foreshadowing. And um, if you remember, we, uh, we talked about, well, why do we use foreshadowing? Actually, let me see if I have the right slides here. Okay, there we go. Um, why do we use foreshadowing? It's to uh, help us to see or to understand or to recognize what comes next. And so I use examples from movies, books, that sort of thing, music, scenery, certain kind of language, certain kind of lyrics, tells us what to expect about what's coming next. And the Bible's no different. The Bible foreshadows, and, and we call it prophecy. And from a biblical perspective, prophecy includes both telling and foretelling. And let me just review that real quick. Um, telling is a part of prophecy where you speak or apply God's truth to a particular situation. So I say something that is true, and I'm not necessarily predicting what's going to happen. I, I'm telling you the truth of, of, of that. Uh, it, it could be, let's, let's take out of the realm of, of theology for a second. If you run more, you will get faster. If you lift more weights, you will probably get stronger. Although at my age, if you run too much and you lift too much, things break, and that's also prophecy as well. But you, you see what I'm saying? That there are some things that are just simply, they're true. If you do this, this will result. And from a spiritual perspective, that's part of what prophecy does. If you trust in God, he will change your life. If you follow his word, life will be better. Now, we don't promise uh, material blessing. And say if you become a Christian, you're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise, and things will always go well. Well, they're not going to. But from a spiritual perspective and from a life purpose perspective, following God equals a blessing that one who does know God cannot possibly imagine. And so that is prophetic. And, and so part of preaching, part of evangelism, um, part of just your day-to-day -day, um, interactions with other people is prophetic. You, you speak the truth about the way life actually is in hopes that someone will apply it to their life. Prophecy is also foretelling. And, and as I said last week, this is what a lot of people think of when they think of prophecy, telling us what will happen in the future. Um, and, and so, you know, people oftentimes think of prophecy just being foretelling. It's telling and foretelling. Um, but the Old Testament is full of events, poems, prophetic words, that sort of thing that both tell and foretell. In fact, many, most of the great prophecies in books like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, they were speaking to a current situation um, in which they were telling the people of Israel that if they didn't follow God, this is what would result, but they also contained prophecies that foretold what was going to happen in the future in the Messiah in Jesus Christ. And so what we're doing uh, for these weeks leading up to Christmas is we're, we're looking at um, the nature of foreshadowing prophecy in the Bible. We're kind of hitting pause on Galatians. We'll resume that after Christmas, but we're going to spend the next few weeks uh, continuing to unpack um, those prophecies about Jesus. And so today, we're going to look at the genealogy of Jesus. I, I know last week, Trey, I said we're going to talk about um, the sacrifice of Abraham. That's actually the fourth week. I, I was wrong when I said that. Um, but we're going to talk about the genealogy of Jesus. And what I want you to think about for a second is we all have, we all have genealogy. Amen? You, you all have ancestors. You did not simply get born into this world. And um, people like Nancy studies genealogy and loves, if, in fact, if you want to get genealogy done, Nancy does a lot of research. You can do now, like there's a 23 to me and things like that, and you get your DNA taken or whatever they do, and then they can tell you you're Swedish or German or Slavic or whatever. Um, but to some extent, we all have some record of our genealogy, whether it goes back a couple generations um, or in the case of uh, parts of my family, it goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, it's amazing how much we resemble those genealogies. 
You may think you don't, but you do in many cases. I think about the first Magnell. Uh, back then, the name was Magnilius. It was in the late 1500s. Um, Canut Magnilius was the first Magnell, and it was taken from an area in which his dad was the judge, uh, a small area that is a nothing in Sweden called Magnaby. And um, he took the last name Magnilius because he was a Lutheran pastor. Go figure. <laughs> so here he was in the 1500s as a Lutheran pastor, and he took the name Magnilius because uh, back then you typically, uh, I'll give you a little, you don't need to know this, and this is not to Jesus, but anyway, um, Scandinavian kind of 101. Typically you took your dad's name, his first name, and that was your last name. So my children would be Christian's son and Christian's daughter, okay, if we were really found like an old, you know, Swedish, old Norwegian, old Icelandic way of naming. For priests, um, Lutheran, uh, in Swedish word is pressed, for Lutheran pastors, they would take the name of the area they were from and they would Latinize it. So he would, from Magnaby, so he was Magnilius, and it later on got shortened to Magnell. And so here we are 450 years later, and his ancestor is a pastor talking about him being a pastor. So, you know, there are some things that are kind of predictable. We, we are the products, both good and bad, and there are definitely some bad things. Okay, we are products of our genealogy. So I think, you know, if we were to go around this room, many of you have ancestors that either had jobs that you have, that looked the way you do, that acted in similar ways. We are products of our genealogy. Now, when we look at the genealogy of Jesus, we see something similar. His ancestors were a foreshadowing of what Jesus would become and what God would do in him. Uh, we see both the reasons for Messiah and we see the Messiah. We see kings, we see prostitutes, we see success, we see brokenness, we see the gospel. We see the reality of why we need Jesus. We see what God would do through Jesus in his genealogy. So what we're going to do today is we're going to kind of hang out in Matthew chapter 1. I was going to read all, all of verses 1 through 16. I'm not going to subject that to you uh, or subject you to that or that to you, one or the other. But uh, we're, we're going to kind of go through it piece by piece. We're not going to look at the whole thing, but if you have your Bibles with you, what I would do is keep them open to Matthew chapter 1, and I'm going to be kind of going back and forth between some of the verses in 1 through 16. Um, I do have the verses up on the screen. We have the verses in the, the um, online, if you go to the Bible app, uh, the Holy Bible app, version Holy Bible app, and look for events. It's got the sermon notes and the Bible readings on there. Um, or you can follow along up the screen, or you can follow in your paper Bibles. So what I want to do is I want to start with Matthew uh, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And so Matthew writes this. This is a record of the ancestors of Jesus, the Messiah, a descendant of David and of Abraham. Abraham was a father of Isaac. Isaac was a father of Jacob. Jacob was a father of Judah and his brothers. Okay, so we begin uh, by hearing that this is a genealogy of Jesus, who is a descendant of David and Abraham. I want you to think for a second. In a genealogy, who do you normally put first? If you're going to have two names, so how do you normally order them? You order them by what? Age. Okay? So you, you have Abraham, and then Isaac, and then Jacob, and then blah, 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 you know, all, all the way down. But in the beginning of this, um, before Matthew really gets going, he says, David and Abraham. Why would he say David first? This is a genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, a descendant of David and Abraham. Why, why the emphasis on David? Why do you think? Okay, he was, he was the king, and he prophesied that Jesus... Yes, okay. You're on the right track. That, that's right. What else? Why, why put David first? What's that? No, he wasn't the oldest. <laughs> he wasn't older than Abraham. Why, why put David before Abraham? <laughs> exactly. And that was what Nancy was... I know, Nancy, I know you were... I, I just, you know... Um, the prophecy was about Jesus the Messiah, who was to be, they believed, correctly, a descendant of David. That the Messiah is coming, and he's going to be ancestor of David. And so Matthew begins this genealogy by saying... Jesus, the Messiah, is a descendant of David and Abraham um, because this is establishing Messiah. So putting David first naturally would, would make sense. Um, you've got 
in David and Abraham, both the king and the promise. And last week we looked at the promise. Um, the old covenant was a covenant of, uh, you follow me, I will bless you, you will have land, things will go well. Um, and then Abraham was also the promise that his seed, singular, that is Jesus Christ, would be a blessing to all people. So let's talk about David for a second. Okay, so Jesus is a, um, a descendant of David. And what do we know about David? We know that he was, first of all, a man after God's own heart. We see that in Matthew 13, verse 14. Um, what, what does that mean? And I know, you know, a lot of you don't know what I'm talking about, but for those who've read that, what does it mean that David is a man after God's own heart? Why would the Bible say that? Was David a perfect, sin-free man? Not at all. There's some good stories we're going to come to later on. So why, why was David a man after God's own heart? Oh, I love the sound of the rain. That's cool. Yes. And, and, that, and that is, that, that's the, you know, we, we could do a 10-week series just to David, but that's, that's the right answer. David, even though he fell short, looked to glorify God. Even when he fell short, and, and David fell short a lot. Uh, but David's life was about glorifying and pointing to God. And in fact, some of the Psalms in the Bible, David writes talking about his screw-ups, his mistakes, his sin. And think about that. He didn't have to write that. You know, he could have whitewashed that out of, you know, history. He didn't have to write things uh, about that. But David was brutally honest about his relationship with God. He was, it was also prophesied that an eternal kingdom would come from one of his descendants. Uh, Second uh, Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 is an example of that. The Jews believed rightly that the Messiah would be a descendant of David, and the genealogy establishes that Jesus was, in fact, a descendant of David. Um, David wrote a lot of the Psalms, Psalm 110, which I don't have on the screen, but if you have paper Bibles, uh, you can turn to Psalm 110, and I'm going to, uh, to go ahead and read it from my Bible, but uh, I've also got that uh, written in your notes uh, in the bulletin. But Psalm 110. This is a psalm that David wrote, and uh, I want you to listen to it for a second and think about how it prophesies the Messiah. The Lord said to my Lord, and there are two words used there, Yahweh said to Adonai, Yahweh that is God the Father said to my Lord. And so David, writing this, he was the king of Israel. Did David have a Lord? I mean, I mean from an earthly perspective, did he, did he, he, was, he was top of the food chain. It would be like the president saying, um, God said to the president, well, well, you're the president. It wouldn't make any sense. And so David is saying, the Lord said to the Lord, Yahweh said to the Lord, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, make them a footstool under your feet. The Lord will extend your powerful kingdom for Jerusalem. You will rule over your enemies. When you go to war, your people will serve you willingly. You are arrayed in holy garments, and your strength will be renewed each day like the morning dew. The Lord has taken an oath and will not break his vow. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Let me pause there for a second. Order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a figure from the book of Genesis. I'm going quick. I feel like I'm auctioning off theology here. Um, but uh, I, I don't want us to get lost in the weeds. Melchizedek was both a king and a priest. In Israel, the king could not, by law, be priest. David was not a priest. David was not allowed to do priestly things. So David was foreshadowing someone who would be both priest, as Jesus is. He's our mediator between us and God, and king. So here David is, a thousand years before Christ, writing a, a poem about the coming Messiah. He says, The Lord stands at your right hand to protect you. He will strike down many kings when his anger erupts. He will punish the nations and fill their lands with, with corpses. He will shatter heads over the whole earth, but he himself will be refreshed from brooks along the way. He will be victorious. David is writing this about the future Messiah. Now, I'm not expecting you to remember all the details of that verse. I've got in your bulletin. Um, what we're talking about is the Bible foreshadowing, as it does all the time in the book of Psalms, Jesus. And this is just one example of that written by somebody David was descended from, that is David. The genealogy in the second verse also references Jacob and Judah. Let me go back and uh, read that second verse. It begins by saying, Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Uh, what was Jacob's other name? Israel. 
Okay, Jacob was also known as Israel, so you can kind of pack that away. Um, so Israel was the father of Judah and his brothers. There were 12 of them total. And so Judah and 11 brothers. And so um, the genealogy mentions that Jesus is a descendant of Judah. You've got Abraham, you've got Isaac, you've got Jacob, uh, who's also got Israel. And so we've also got a prophecy about Judah that we can kind of set next to this uh, in, the, in, uh, in the Bible. So I'm going to read Genesis chapter 49. And Harrison, if you would follow along, I'm gonna, I've got verses uh, 8 and 9 up there, and I'm going to read the whole thing off my iPad. But uh, this is the prophecy um, that Jacob gives as he's dying. Um, he's blessing Judah, and he's blessing all the sons. And he says, Judah, your brothers will praise you. You'll grasp your enemies by the neck. All your relatives will bow before you. Judah, my son, is a lo young lion that has finished eating his prey. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from his descendants, until the coming of the one to whom it belongs, the one whom all nations will honor. He ties his foal to a grapevine, the colt of his donkey to a choice vine. He washes his clothes in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine, his teeth are whiter than milk. I'm going to kind of come back uh, to a few of these, uh, these verses. But let's talk about why that, that's important, okay? This was written around 1800 B.C., or the, the prophecy, I should say, was given around 1800 B.C., 1750 B.C. It was written down by Moses in 1400 B.C., telling us that Judah will be praised by the brothers, and there's the rest of Israel, be a ruler and have the scepter. Do you all know what a scepter is? A scepter is one of those, those things that like a, a, a king or a ruler holds. And so it's saying that Judah is going to have the scepter. Verse 10 says, a ruler's staff, um, uh, and the scepter will not depart from Judah until the coming of the one to whom it belongs, the one whom all nations will honor. I want you to pause here, and we're, we're going to reflect on that, and I'm, I'm going to tell you why this is significant. First of all, the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Judah ended up being one of two tribes left um, after Israel was overtaken by the Assyrians um, in 721 B.C., and then um, the rest of it was taken off into captivity by the Babylonians in 587 B.C., but because it was only Judah and Benjamin that were basically left, um, the people of Israel came to be known as the Jews. That's where the name comes from. It's from the tribe of Judah. So when we say today, when we refer to the Jews, it comes from that word Judah. They were the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Judah was the one that ended up ruling over the people of Israel, starting with King David. And so descendants of David were necessarily of the tribe of, of Judah. And what I want you to think about is this is written hundreds of years before David be, would become the king in Israel. There was no reason. When, when Israel was saying, you know, Judah, the, the scepter will not depart from you. You will be a ruler. You will be in charge. That would make no sense. Judah wasn't the oldest. Judah wasn't the most prominent. I mean, you could maybe say Joseph. There are a lot of ways you could go. But the idea that Judah would be in charge... Outside of prophecy, there's no way to explain it. Do you follow me? So here is, here is um, this prophecy 400 years before David had become king. Actually, 700 years. It was written down 400 years before David had become king. Saying, Judah will be in charge. But it goes a step further. That rule will not depart from Judah until the coming of the one to whom it belongs the one whom all nations will honor. Let's not talk about David. Why? Because the scepter will not depart from Judah. Well, Judah wasn't in charge until David. And so Judah was in charge until the one, Jesus, honored by all nations. The king of Israel, was he honored by all nations? No. It was a small country in the Middle East. It was for sure not honored by all nations, but Jesus is. Christianity is really the only worldwide religion. I know Islam's big. I know Buddhism and Hinduism are big, but it's really only worldwide religion. You can go anywhere in the world, and there are some unreached tribes, of course, but you can go virtually anywhere in the world, and the name of Jesus is lifted up. We've got a group of eight of us going to Nepal. 
Nepal is primarily a Hindu country, but there are people lifting up the name of Jesus in Nepal. There are people this morning lifting up the name of Jesus in Brazil, in Russia, in, in Sweden, in Italy, in Africa, all around the world. The one who was coming, that is Jesus, is being lifted up and honored. And you cannot say that about anybody else, anybody else in history. And here, 1,700 years before Christ, Jacob was saying, this will be so. Now, I know I'm, I'm going a lot of different directions, but if you can reflect on that, your mind should be blown. The Bible said this would happen, and it happened. And here we are 2,000 years later in Florida, of all places. We're from around the world, right? And we're here lifting up the name of this one that they said 3,700 years ago, yeah, they're going to lift up his name. The whole world will honor him. And here we are 3,700 years later. That should blow your mind. The genealogy of Jesus is rich. What's interesting is that genealogies did not normally include women. Sorry, women, that's just the way genealogies work. They went by the men. You know, this was the father of so-and-so, this is the father of so this it, 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 blah, 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 right? With five exceptions. There are five women mentioned in his genealogy. And these are notable exceptions. We've got Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary. So let's look at those, uh, those exceptions. First of all, in Matthew chapter 1, uh, well, I'm sorry, I hit it up on the screen. Chapter 1, verse 3, um, it says, Judah was a father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Tamar was the father of Perez and Zerah by Judah. Why is this significant? What was Tara's relationship or Tamar's relationship uh, to Judah? Does anybody know off the top of your head? That was his daughter-in-law. It's kind of icky, isn't it? It's, kinda, it's a lot icky. She was married to one of, Judah's, uh, one of Judah's sons, the Judah we've just been talking about, and that son died without leaving an heir. And tradition in the Middle East at that time was if you died without leaving an heir, the next oldest brother would then become the husband of that, of that woman. And that son did not want to have a child with her, and he ended up dying himself. And so here she was, widowed twice without children. And in that culture, if you were a widow and didn't have children, you, you, were, you were lost. You had nobody support you, nobody cared, nobody providing assistance for you. It wasn't like today where you have Social Security and insurance and, you know, survivor's benefits and things like that. And um, Judah promised um, that his next son would marry Tamar, but he went back on his promise. And so one day, years later, Tamar posed as a temple prostitute. And um, Judah um, had relations with her, and she got pregnant by her father-in-law. And by the way, one of them, Perez, is an ancestor of Jesus. If you think your family is dysfunctional, you don't even know, okay? <laughs> you know, if you sit here and go, oh, you know, my family's kind of messed up. Oh, really? Um, the, the interesting, because we've got Judah and we've got Tamar, and we've got kids in Jesus' genealogy from that union. Then we've got in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, it says, Salmon was a father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was a father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Who was Rahab? Does anybody know off the top of your head? What's it? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank, you. Thank you, Nancy. The rest of you are like, we don't know who she is. Just talk, Chris, because we just want the sermon to end. <laughs> yeah, you do want to be obvious. Okay, so we are um, in, in the city of Jericho, uh, Rahab was both prostitute and she was obviously not of Israel. Um, she helped out Israel, and Joshua promised um, to, to allow her to live, and she ended up becoming the mother of Boaz. And then um, Boaz ended up marrying Ruth, who was also a foreigner. Um, and, and, and this is significant because Israel understood so much of its genealogy incorrectly, but they understood it to be pure of foreign influence, right? And you, you've got Rahab, who was both a foreigner and a prostitute. You've got Ruth, who was a foreigner who followed along her mother, uh, Naomi, and um, followed her even when her husband had died, and Naomi's husband died, and Ruth's husband had died. And she followed her back um, to Judah and eventually uh, became the great, 
grandmother of King David. And so those women are significant. We've got a verse later. It says, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother was Bathsheba. And I probably got the answer. I'm not going to ask you that. Um, The story of Bathsheba. Um, David committed adultery with Bathsheba, had her husband Uriah killed, and from that union, that amazing marriage, you know, that dysfunctional situation, came Solomon, author of much of Scripture, or or, excuse me, not much Scripture, author of much of the book of uh, Proverbs, and uh, even some of the Psalms. You've got Solomon, who is the son of an adulterer and adulteress, and David, a murderer. And then you've got, in verse 16, Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Mary gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Messiah. We've got Mary. Not married. Single mother. Engaged to Joseph. Conspicuous. It was obvious uh, that she had obviously cheated on David. And obviously, she either cheated or they had done the wrong thing. But it was conspicuous, nevertheless. So put it all together, Matthew goes out of his way to point out incest, prostitution, foreign lineage, adultery, out of wedlock births. This wasn't the men. There were five women he pointed out and said these were the mothers of these guys. He points out why we need a Messiah. So we put it all together. So what of the sermon? The Old Testament was very specific about who the Messiah would be. Matthew fills us in on the lineage of Jesus. In doing so, he does two things that are instructive for us. First of all, he shows us that Jesus is the Messiah. He is descended from David. He is descended from Abraham. But then he reminds us why we need a Messiah. I want you to close up here. Think about this. I'm sure you have brokenness in your family. And if you say you don't, you probably do it a generation or two back. Everybody has issues. Everybody has brokenness. Everybody has sin. Everybody needs a Messiah. You know, it would be easy to whitewash the life of Jesus. It would be easy to whitewash the life of the disciples, the stories of the disciples. In fact, we see all throughout um, the beginning of the New Testament, the Gospels, the disciples are doing the wrong thing at the wrong time in the wrong place. But the Bible does the opposite. The Bible shows us brokenness. The Bible shows us need. The Bible shows us the dysfunction of of, of some of the major figures in the New Testament. Only one of them is without sin, and that is Jesus Christ, who died for the sins of everybody else in his genealogy and everybody that come after him. Today, what I want to challenge you to do um, as we pray is to consider that call. Jesus is calling you to faith. He's calling you to life. He's calling you to walk in a truth that is not readily available in the world. And so if you would stand up and join me in prayer as we close up, and I I, I would encourage you today to consider whether or not you have that relationship with Christ. And if you don't, let today be the day when you move in that relationship with God through Jesus Christ, that you say yes to what he is offering. Maybe today is a day of renewal, that you've had that relationship, but but today you just need to reaffirm and, and recommit yourself to Christ. Maybe today there's somebody on your heart that you're praying for, somebody who's sick, somebody who's grieving, uh, somebody you just need to extend the, the love of Christ to. Whatever the case, let's go to God in prayer, saying, Father, we're so grateful for the healing mercy there is in Jesus Christ. We thank you that over the last thousands of years, people are proclaimed that there is life and there is love in you. And we stand in that great line today. Today, we can count Jesus among our genealogy because by faith, we are children of God through Jesus. We are adopted into, we are grafted into that great lineage of both heroes and horrors, of both good and bad of both love and hate, of dysfunction, of brokenness, but also of peace, of patience, of perseverance. So, Father, today we give that to you. For those who, who, who want to know you, today is the day, Lord. 
for them to say yes. For those who, who need to recommit, they give their lives to again. For those that we hold close to our hearts,